Hi, everyone. I'm Christina. Welcome to the Revolver Fan First podcast, where we go deep with each artist on their history as a fan. Today, we have Ken Andrews of Failure, who's also a record producer, done solo stuff, done, you've done a lot of stuff. You've, you've got a lot of output. Yep. I've been doing it for 30 years, if you can believe that. That's, that's pretty amazing. Like things, things pass quickly, you know, it's, um, yeah. and it's good to um, immortalize yourself in some way. Um, so we ask every artist uh, the same question, the first question, which is, who was the first artist you put on a pedestal? Probably Robert Smith and The Cure. Yeah? Pro I, think, I think that was the one where I really went deep. The first one where I really went deep. And also the first artist that I really got it into when I was playing guitar. Yeah. Uh, the other bands that I liked before that I hadn't started playing yet. I'm a kind of late uh, musician starter. I started when I was 18. Yeah, right. So what's that? It's uh, like 85? Yep. Were you a goth? No. I, was, uh, <laughs> I had to ask. I, I should have been because <laughs> I was into goth music. Yeah. And I actually went to, I, I, I went to high school in San Diego and I saw something in a newspaper that was like a goth club. And it's listed all my favorite bands. Awesome. And no, I, I wasn't you. sure if they were playing there or what the heck it was. I was very confused. I didn't know anything about the club scene, live music or DJs or anything. And so I got someone to drive me down there and I went into this club and it was just all it was like 200 goths standing around listening to Bauhaus awesome. and I, I was wearing like OP shorts and like a white t-shirt <laughs> how did that go down <laughs> but I knew all the music probably better than them um so it was interesting uh yeah. it was very interesting uh people were looking at me pretty strange <laughs> yeah but that's you know that's passion trumps um costume you know i think so i think well maybe in some scenes it's um, not it, yeah it didn't that night but no 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 <laughs> goth clubs are really good um if you're underage because if you look like a goth girl who was uh, all done up they usually let you in that's just a, a fun fact from my youth um yeah. but, but um robert smith is an interesting one because he's so good at melancholy and beautiful melancholy and that's something i think you excel at what um was that a part of it like we how did melancholy music make you feel did it make was it something you turned to at moments for solace or did it make you happy i don't know whether that, um yeah it, well it, it did it didn't make me happy i guess i i just identified with it yeah i just it, it, it when i discovered it i mean i i heard more like uh I'm thinking like um, Japanese whispers first and I liked it. But w w when I really dove in was pornography, yeah. which was the, the to me, their darkest record. Um, maybe Faith is also well, the one right after it. So those two were like when I discovered that people were making music like that, it just my head exploded. Yeah, because it's so clearly was not designed to ever be on the radio or for mass consumption in any way. Yeah, you know, it was it was just gnarly, and I was just wow, I was I was mesmerized, and um, it affected me deeply. Yeah, um, and you know, and then it later I kind of grew into the to the more duality of it, the beautiful melodies um, uh, juxtaposed against the darker mood mm. kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it was a big deal for me. Yeah, well, it does bring it out. Like um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's special. Who was, I guess, who was the first artist you saw yourself in? So rather than a pedestal, you felt like it was communicating something back to you that um you could identify with or is it the same answer you know i think like 
Robert Smith was more like a pedestal and 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 it kind of like it seemed somewhat supernatural because of the imagery mm. and the costume and everything that he had going. Yeah. Um punk rock and sort of like early grunge that's when I was like, hey, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh <laughs> And and that's why I think the first failure record is more punky and more stripped down and more, um, you know, just more kind of just more like garage. Yeah. And that was Steve Albini, right? Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a Steve Albini record. I I, I love it. I think it's cool. Like, I like how dreamy and, um, you know, like the, it, the cleanest the nature of your later albums. But that that thing is cool. You know, it's um, yeah. No, I mean, it's all cool, but it's 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 like I was like, if you like compare it, it's yeah. How did you um decide on that and go into it, and how do you feel about it now? That particular, yeah, the first the first yeah. album, yeah. Um, what well, I mean, I think Greg was twenty. Yeah. Uh, the drummer was my maybe a little older, maybe a year older than me, so it was like 24, 22, and twenty. Yeah. And um, we weren't ready. I mean, listening back to me, it's, it's like a band with really good ideas. Yeah. But who didn't really know how to play it so good yet. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, I mean, I we're actually in the in the middle of kind of building a chronology going back and trying to reverse engineer Oh, when everything cool. actually happened. Yeah. And one of the things that I um, noticed is that, you know, we we played 19 shows before we made our first record. That's that's it. Probably less rehearsals than that, too. So, I mean, we were so green. Yeah. You know, it just and looking back i guess if i had one regret it would be maybe maybe if we would have just done a, like another six or, or or months or a year of playing shows mm -hmm. and maybe maybe getting to go on tour first would have helped us on that first record but yeah it, it, it captures exactly where we were at at the yeah. time and and so for that it's a good document for sure yeah, well, it's interesting, like, if you compare it to, like, the latest album, which is so, like, dense and layered, and it's sort of like a, it's it's a tapestry. I mean, I don't know if that's the right word, but there is, yeah. like, there's there's all these colours and, like, you can hear how much depth there is to it, which is quite starkly different to, the, to that. Was that, and you guys made this latest album, I'm going all over the place, um, from Jams, is that right? Like, you yes. Consciously, yeah, so can you tell us about that and how different that was maybe from the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the beginning was the first album was more kind of me as the primary songwriter. Yeah. And kind of coming in with like, here's a rough arrangement. Here's a, ch a part and a B part. And 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 as the band progressed, it became more of a songwriting duo between yeah. myself and Greg. So and so now we're at the point where we're um yeah we've been doing this for so long doing different bands and have a lot of different musical experiences under our belt so the way we can work now is a lot more free mm. and there there isn't this uh division anymore between oh now we're writing the songs now we're rehearsing the songs now we're demoing the songs now we're going into the studio to record them with a producer yeah, that's all, all of those walls are are gone. So we're working on an album as soon as we're in a room together with musical instruments, basically. Sweet. Everything's always been re being recorded. And then at some point we go back and evaluate it. And so on this new record, I, I think we just took that concept of um recording improvisations and formalized it a little bit more we actually booked the studio out for a month basically mm. and went into it and said let's just improvise and do not 
stop and try to write songs or arrange them or anything only improvise and just create this um you know yeah 40 hours of raw material basically and then go back to it later when when you like months later so that you have uh, this wholly different kind of objectivity on it yeah where you could kind of we could hardly remember playing any of it and so that made it really fun to just pick out the interesting moments that appealed to us yeah and and when you do it that way it's interesting because that way everyone in the band is kind of on board with that song because you've already kind of came up with the original original idea for it together in the as moment. opposed in the moment so it's kind of like hey sh should we turn this into a song yeah we we all like it we all played on it boom there you go whereas like sometimes coming in with a song a band member coming in with a song it's kind of like everyone's like mm, i don't know like so it was a different it was a different thing it was fun yeah. you've constructed true band democracy which is a rare thing you know? yeah yeah free yeah. feeling I mean, band democracy yeah is that really different to how you do it as, as a producer like and is that kind of a part of it that you can't really it's not you can't really you don't really want to record 40 hours of material with the band that are paying you to do it you know like i'm not not to trivialize it or commercialize it in some way but you, that would be a much more laborious process than it would be because you're a person outside of it i would imagine i don't know yeah i've never been a part of uh, producing a record like that yeah um they, that's just not it's more like the bands that uh i've produced sometimes they don't have a, a lot of material ready and other times they have 50 demos <laughs> and so the, and they're like here's 50 ideas can you please help us oh. narrow it narrow it down to 20 yeah and then we record 20 and then 14 end up on the album yeah that's kind of like well it's, it's all interesting i mean there's no rules to how you do this right like you know was there something you were listening to like as a fan that was the catalyst for writing songs? Like, do you remember when you first went, I have something to say and I need to express it? Or like, was it something you're listening to? Or was it a personal experience? Or both? I, it was just, it was just, um, it, just listening to music a lot, listening to The Cure a lot. I mean, we're talking about like 88 right now. Right. Like I'm, uh, you know, sophomore, junior in college. Yeah. I'm learning how to play guitar and I'm just finding myself really attracted to recording, even though I'm not a very good guitarist yet. The one of the first things that I wanted to do once I could string four chords together was to record those four chords. <laughs> And overdub and an overdub on myself. Yeah, I was super interested in overdubbing on myself from a very early point in my musical development. Yeah, like recording and learning how to play happened at the same time for me. Yeah, right. So when people say, well, like, how did you learn how to produce and how do you even produce your own material because that seems weird like don't you want to be like uh more objective <laughs> and to me it seems natural because of the way i learned all these skills i learned them at the same time yeah there's no separation to me between recording guitar and playing guitar it's kind of like one thing yeah that's quite did you, you did you go to film school Is yes that yeah, yes. did that play a role? Did you have a recording studio to mess around with? Like, did you have access to equipment or? I did have access to film equipment, but yeah. not audio equipment. Yeah. I had to have, I, I had my, my, my first full on recording setup was a cassette four track. Yeah. A Tascam four track. Um, I had a Yamaha drum machine used. I bought all of it from the local um used music store in hollywood 
Yes. I got sir. a used drum machine. I got a used cassette four track. I had one bass guitar. I had one electric guitar and one Sure SM58 vocal mic. And I basically wrote and demoed up the majority of the first failure record on that setup in, okay. in my apartment. It's interesting. Um, I mean, it's interesting how different it is to having a computer. <laughs> like you know like do you think the physicality of it changes it like having all these like you know yes i do and uh, you, i read something really interesting i think it was john lecky do you know that producer british producer i did like stone roses and oh, stuff cool. you yeah, know yeah. like more, more 90s I read a quote from him recently, basically explaining why he got out of the business. And it, yeah. it, he basically said, I don't want to be a typist. I want to be a producer. And to be a producer th these days means you're a typist. That's a really interesting way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I don't necessarily out. disagree with him. Yeah. I do think if you're a producer in 2022, you're on the computer the whole time so if you feel like that environment or that you know setup like i have right in front of me here is is uh thwarting your creativity it's not going to be cool i never f experienced that myself i yeah. feel like it opens up creativity um because one of the main things that i love about recording the computer is that um, you can work for a certain amount of time on a given idea and then abandon it for a while. Yeah. But when you come back, it's exactly as you left it, which that was the problem in analog world for my, yeah. the whole first half of my career was that you had to finish it because if you wanted to move on to the next song, you had to reset everything. And it just was like, you know, it had to yeah, yeah, be yeah. done in one go. And that was a problem for me because I love like taking a break from something. Mm. You know, you kind of hit, hit a creative wall sometimes on something or you've just heard it too many times and you, you can't get your bearings on it anymore. It's so nice to be able to leave it, put it in a folder and come back to it a week, a month, a year later and hear it where you left off yeah. There you go and because there's been so much time you're able to um um zero in on on uh what can make it better yeah yeah you know your ears get your, your ears lose their memory and then lose the charge of like how you yeah I, I think i think it's such an important thing to do to um step back from it and and it's funny you talk about the physicality of recording because it's the same as film editing right like once upon a time people physically cut the film you know like, on the flat beds on a flat yeah. like it's proper yeah. old school like I'm, I'm I had mentors at like as a uh, like doing films and stuff that did that and they were like this is so different to have to kind of go over here and there's something that shares it I love that dark speed video that's sick mm. that you directed yeah how did that come about I'm just curious. It's it's a yeah. Found on well, we we met David um, Das Malchian, the the actor. Um, yeah. We met him in the '90s, actually, because he was uh, he was making his own indie film called Animals, um, and because he was a failure fan, he wanted to use. Uh, I can't remember if it was just an image of our album or and the music was playing in the background exactly but he just reached out to us and said hey i'm a huge fan and i use this in my indie film and we were like yeah of course go for it Sick. um but that opened up the dialogue and we kind of be became friends and so um i reached out to him um as we were finishing that record and said hey we want to make a music video for for this song what do you think it, we actually greg and i took a lunch with him and we basically wrote the concept uh over lunch awesome and we ended up shooting it like two weeks later yeah sick. um 
but you know he's like to me he's like an a level actor so yeah. like half of it is just like getting hit in, it in front of the camera and rolling <laughs> you know? which is cool you know yeah who um who do you feel like musically is like that you just put them in front of this shit and just let them roll who who kind of you you who are you the biggest fan of to watch like uh, like live. within your band yeah like no no like record like within your band or beyond like oh well who, like I mean, knocks you out yeah i mean the thing about my band is that i'm the worst musician in the band <laughs> <laughs> by it's by a long good, shot right? yeah i mean yeah. i'm more like the kind of like idea hmm. person technical person i i can sing okay i could yeah. probably sing better than they can but in terms of actually playing your instrument they excel so i r really appreciate being able to, to just like not have to do a ton of takes with these guys ever it's just like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? Bam, it's just down. I mean, it's that, that I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. It makes it so much more fun, basically, okay. when you're writing and stuff. So you guys are obviously, you're a cult band. You've always had cool other musicians like you. You know, you've, I'm glad you came back. Um, and I wanted to know, what is your relationship with Maynard James Keenan? Like, when did you meet? How did you um, how did you know he became a fan? And yeah, just um, a bit of the story behind your relationship, I guess. I definitely remember first meeting Maynard at Club Lingerie. I just don't know if it was the end of 89 or the beginning of 90. Yeah. Uh, but the thing was, is that both bands, Tool and Failure, formed around the same time started playing our first shows around the same time and so um we we became aware of each other and we played a show at club laundry and after we played i was hanging out with some friends at the bar and maynard came up to me and i didn't know who he was or i didn't even know who tool i'd heard of tool but i hadn't seen them live and uh, he's introduced himself. I'm the singer of Tool. This is the second, show, fa second failure show I've seen. We're looking for local bands that we can kind of team up with and play shows with because the last two shows we played, the promoter put us with these really horrible acts that we don't want to play with ever again. So we're going out ourselves and finding acts that we want to play with would you like to play some shows with us and i was like yeah do you do you have a tape and he gave me his tape <laughs> we exchanged tapes <laughs> and so um that was yeah that was fun that was and then like i th i think it was like a month later we were both playing rajis in the uh, downstairs room and um yeah the rest is then they took us on tour and and then they exploded and we didn't basically <laughs> back in the 90s what was the musical landscape at that time when you were starting the band like what did you see happening around you and what what were you excited about as well to to join that world of being a musician and and yeah well i mean part of there were two things. What, what what I was enjoying being creative and making, you know, art with friends, basically. That was cool. But there was an, another thing going on in Hollywood at the time, which was hair metal was still <laughs> going really strong. And and so, you know, clearly, like there were a bunch of bands that were n n not part of that you know, Tool, Us, and, you know, several other bands. Um, so I always felt like part of the early days of f failure was actually a reaction against that stuff, specifically the band's name. We, I don't know how seriously we took the band in the beginning in terms of like wanting to become, uh, you know, 
a signed rock band that was making money and stuff. We were just like, our immediate goal was to play shows at bars. <laughs> so our friends could see it, you know, that was it. Awesome. Um, and so we just thought it would be so cool for the hair bands to see uh, a band called Failure playing <laughs> uh, 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 the same clubs they were. Yeah, because at that point, they the hair bands had kind of codified and and clarified what it meant to be a, a professional band member. You know, it was all like you had to have the pro hair. The other thing that that was happening is that we, we had been advertising for a bassist who ended up being Greg um, for ye like two years in the recycler and the music connection. And so we were seeing all the all the hair bands looking for bass players and looking for guitar players and stuff and reading their ads and their ads were like, you know, must have pro hair. Must have. I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh, that makes me so amused. Yeah, uh, that makes me so. What was your ad? I have to know what was in your ad. What was your ad for the? Yeah. Well, the thing of it is, is like I mentioned before, we're putting together this um, chronology. And Greg just told me yesterday that he has the ad. <laughs> he just has to find it. So he's looking through his shit right now. It said something about the cure. Bauhaus and Peter Murphy <laughs> or or some what's you know again? what's Peter Murphy from again I'm just blind. Bauhaus yeah, but Bauhaus. he had solo stuff at the time I think or you know I, I really want to see the ad I know the Cure and Bauhaus were in there yeah. I'm not sure what the other band was we said you know moody and the the phrase moody trio was in there and we basically ran that ad for two years, both in the Recycler and the Music Connection magazine uh, for for, you know, better part of two years. We interviewed, I think, something like maybe eight bass players on the phone. We never got to the second stage of actually playing with anyone because the phone conversations went so bad. It was just like, yeah, this is not going to work out. Bye. Yeah. Um, and so I was losing interest. I mean, honestly, I was like, we're, <laughs> we're never going to be able to get a band together. And both my roommate and I, Robert, who was the original drummer in failure, were both in college. Yeah. So and I was studying film and I was already starting to work as a music video director in town. Yes. Sir. Um, so the whole thing about failure was kind of like. You know, maybe it's going to happen. Maybe it's not going to happen. Who knows? It's a fun thing. We'll try it. And then Greg called yeah. and we were like, this guy, this guy could work out. Let's go meet with him. We met with him. Then we booked a rehearsal space. And that was the first time where the band, the three of us actually got together in a room. And that was in late 89. Awesome. That's great. Well, I mean, it's not great. It took you two years. That, that yeah. Yeah. No, it was, it was, yeah, that was, that part of it was weird. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's like, yeah, well, I mean, look, it came through at the, at, in the end, and that was, you know, you got to believe in divine timing or, you know, divine goddamn patience, I guess, on some level. The thing of it was, to me, it just seemed like England was just way ahead yeah. of America in terms of, of cool music, you yeah. know? We, we were just stuck in this sort of corporate hair metal thing and all the cool stuff was being made over there. What did you think of Gang of Four? I'm just I like them. I saw them. Yeah, I sick. saw them in concert in the 90s. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 They're a great like lean angular. Yeah. Kind of. Thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, I love that about Andy Gill. I think. Um, yeah. I'm just really sad he died. Um, but left a lot of stuff that changed a lot of people. And I mean, what else can you do? That's a, that's a thing to do. And, you know, and you, yeah. And you had an impact and you've had an impact and you're still continuing to make one. And that's, that's awesome, man. Like, it's good to make stuff. It's good. I mean, aside. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 
I mean, isn't I, I was just reading something the other day that, that creating art mm. is basically a um, a uh, what would you call it? Like a a, a fight, uh, not a fight, but a um, an effort against death. Yeah. Right. Because it's, it's like it's a way for you to live past your um, mortality. Yeah. And I never really thought about that, but it's that's true. That's yeah. definitely true. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it's the same. Um, it's not the same drive as having children, but it kind of is on some level. Mm-hmm. They're your musical babies. Like, you know, it's all a fight. Um, I'm I'm interested Um, just briefly back to Tool. How was how did their fans uh, embrace you and obviously you've done you know things over the years with them as well how did tool fans embrace failure did you feel like you converted some people and i'm just curious well definitely in the 90s uh, in the first few tours Mm. it was in the earlier 90s it was really awesome because the perception well this was my perception that the perception of tool was that it they were a cool new kind of hard rock or metal right and so we did a couple big or longer north american tours with them where there was a lot of universities that we played sick and that was awesome because the crowds were so um varied and Mm -hmm. so like just a great mix of people who were there to hear something new. Yeah. That's why they were there because their friend, Hey, there's a cool new band playing. So their minds were just like open. Yeah. So when we came on, they were like, is this tool? Like there may be a little confusion, but that they got into it. Yeah. Because they hadn't heard a band like failure yet either. Yeah. And so, yeah, we were selling merch and, their the the tool audience was very receptive to us yeah and we made a lot of fans then yeah that's awesome as time went on and their success grew the late the later shows in, that we opened for them in the 90s sometimes parts of their crowd were less receptive to our more melodic material yeah it's interesting um, how time goes on yeah yeah and who's yeah. willing to grow like you know, like people get so hooked on the, the album that they fell in love with first, you know, mm-hmm. that it's, it's very interesting to see people, you know, evolve. And was college radio a big deal as well? Because I get um, from reading books and stuff, it seems like um, that was a big deal, like getting played on college radio, like that was a different um, thing to like the radio. It was a huge deal. Yeah. Big, big deal. Played a huge role in art early um success basically it probably the reason we got a following a live following in los angeles so quickly uh, and like by our 10th show we had three four hundred people showing up That's and it. and it was because the local radio station kxlu the college radio station yep. um was playing our seven inch sick like all day sometimes it was crazy that's awesome um and so people were like oh this is a cool new band let's go see that and they're playing the gaslight the you know the gaslight bar it's 300 capacity and and so it was a very direct line where you could just see hey how'd you hear about it oh i heard you on kxlu today yeah sick that's uh, when cool people did a uh, music programming, not to say that they, there's no cool people doing music program, but there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of forces that affect playlisting now and affect the way we experience music. And I feel like the, you know, like John Peel introduced a whole generation of people to punk rock and we, we had electronic music and, you know, there's so many, um, it makes such a difference that, and I feel like maybe that played a big role in that, the whole alternative scene happening. And it becoming what it what it did, you know, and it stamping out well, metal. <laughs> I mean, college radio then 
was and probably still is to a certain extent just the, the wild west you send yeah. your your seven inch to a college radio programmer and sometimes it would just accidentally land in the trash can and never get <laughs> played and sometimes it would get played a lot you just never knew but i credit our first drummer robert to it was his idea to press up those original first 500 seven inches with two songs on them and he mailed them out himself to like the whole nation basically yeah and so when we went out to do our first tour there were like 20 college radio stations playing our seven inch that we could route our tour around it was yeah it was awesome yeah that's so great like i'm i'm glad that the you know, that it played a role in, in building something that became a, a big thing, you know, and your band, which is really, really important. Well, um, we have um, a question I ask everyone, which is who would be the faces carved into the stone of your musical Mount Rushmore, which is four faces. I thought it was four five faces. for a while, but it is four yeah. faces. I'm Australian. It's not yeah. my fault. Uh, well, definitely Robert Smith. We've already yeah. discussed that. Yeah. Um, That'd be fun in stone. Just saying, That'd yeah. Be the hell, like it'd be yeah. a challenge be... for the Scott for the um cover, yeah. Gotta have the red lipstick too. Yeah, <laughs> just the, <laughs> just a schmear, you know, like yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. I got four. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, Bowie had definitely has to be in there for me. Yeah. Um, did you see him play? No. Never saw him play. Never saw him play. Um, a lot of bands I've never seen play. Yeah. You know, that I love. Uh, yeah. uh, I know it's, this is probably weird because you would, wouldn't would hear it in our music, but I love Eddie Van Halen. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm a huge Van Halen fan. I listen to Van Halen all the time. <laughs> that's <Still>. so great <laughs> what's uh, your favorite van helen song well i could play about maybe four or five not the solos but like um <laughs> <laughs> the baseline the, the, the baseline the riffs yeah 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 the guitar like unchained yeah <laughs> i mean come on the, the unchained i like seriously like you can hear that in some of failure yeah songs. yeah yeah for sure the low tuning and yeah yeah no i mean uh acdc well big huge huge effect on me as a as a you know six 15 16 year old yeah in in terms of just getting into the whole rock ethos you know yeah. um that was our contribution as a country yeah that's right so, you know you're welcome thank you <laughs> Uh, probably be a Peter Gabriel. Yeah, right. He actually Peter has Gabriel. existed a few times. The guy from Mastodon actually said Peter Gabriel, which is um a weird thing for you guys to share. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I guess Peter, you came. Yeah, Peter you came Gabriel of age was in an interesting time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Peter Gabriel is in is in my brain for sure, and I hear his influence on failure on a lot of our newer stuff. Yeah probably so, more yeah um is that four that is four so okay um one of my um goals in life is to one day get all of these carved and then people can yeah. use it i don't want to like hurt a bunch of natural places but um i i i just think it'd be really cool and um i'm just saying um yeah i'm gonna put you aggressively on the spot again and say what are five songs that change your life Last question. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to do this to everyone. <laughs> yeah. It's cruel. Well, um, two or three would be the cure. I yeah. mean, a forest. Um, um, what's the first song on pornography? I'm just escaping me right now. I'm, yeah, I'm terrible. Jesus. My memory's not great. That one. We can yeah, just, that one. That one. A, a, a hundred years. Yeah, awesome. One hundred years. Yeah. Um. 
Wow. Wait, how many did you say? Five. You got two so far. Five. You got three. Okay. Uh, message in a bottle. Yeah. Hey. That was that was a huge one for me learning guitar. Mm. Uh, that's a great song. That's a good song. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and that's actually the band, the the police as a band would be on my head list or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking to my music here. El, uh, you know, um, uh, Benny and the Jets. Dude. Elton John, get it? Yeah, yeah, that is a that is a goddamn tune. Yeah, that that greatest hits record that was came out in the seventies, I think, late yeah. late seventies, where he's like the white suit and it's sitting yeah, yeah, next yeah. to the piano. You know that one? Yeah, yeah sure. that record had a huge impact on me. You would have been a kid. That, it was a very yeah. very little, but yeah. I I remember listening to that record on headphones for forever for years awesome i'm just just mesmerized by the production yeah and the plane and everything about it and i i constantly notice that there's little things here and there little chord changes little inversions that i do sometimes that that are from that you know, you accidentally internalize things. And that's why this show is really fun because um, everyone, you know, all musicians were fans first and um, the, you can't help but um, take it in and express it on some way. So, um, final, yeah. So final question. You got one more song. One more song. Yeah. One more song. One more song. Well, Unchained. Did yeah. I already say that one? No, uh, no. I don't think so. No. Uh, OK. Yeah, I would say Unchained awesome well yeah. that's um yeah that's that's great well thank you for joining us it's been well, really you, fun it's been my really pleasure fun. yeah so um yeah good luck with everything and keep making stuff and actually when you say you're reverse engineering engineering a chronology what do you mean exactly um i'm just trying to figure out like what was our first show uh what was our first tour we we know the obvious things like when the albums were released mm. like that's obvious but one of the f- things i really want to know is how many shows have we played you could because, have yeah but i in the, in the 90s there's not a uh, accurate record oh yeah It'd be- yeah no we know how many we played since we rebooted in 2014 yeah. it's all in the computer yeah but not everything was in the computer in the 90s. <laughs> That's a whole what are you going to do? You're going to make a book or are you going to make a thing or yeah. Uh we're a documentary is being made. Oh, awesome. About the band. That's and, cool. Uh so that's where the idea came from cuz yeah. they wanted to they they thought we would already have that and we didn't. <laughs> So it's a whole journey. Yeah. So we're going back and, you know, but we're finding all these cool things like the the yeah. ad and stuff. And, you know, Killer. Yeah, what a great fun. exercise. I love a good music doco. And you guys have had an interesting time. So um, that's that's exciting. Yeah. I think it's the end of end of this year, early 2023. It'll be out. So you got some time to do all that. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's still a lot of still a few interviews we've got 18 interviews in the can now yeah and uh but we haven't had the film crew follow us on tour yet yeah so that's going to happen this year yeah killer well hopefully um touring will uh come back to full life and uh be sustain to be sustainable and and safe it's been a it's been a rough few years I think for, for music yeah. everywhere. So let's, um, yeah, I don't need to, we don't need to go into that. That's, uh, that's, a, no. that's a given. Um, who are you yeah. doing it with out of interest? Um, is it, you just guys doing it yourself or you got the, the tour it? that we're going to do this year yeah. is going to be, uh, just us. Yeah. Sick. Uh, and we're going to have some form of a film. Yeah. As the opener, which we did on our first tour back in 2014. So this is something that our fans are kind of used to and they kind of like it. So that's cool. That's a really interesting approach. 
So good. Well, good. Come to Australia, please. Love to. We, we really miss American rock and roll. It's been a really long time. Yeah. yeah it's been a rough couple of years for um, us experiencing that. And I have a, a deep fondness for it. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed. Okay. Yeah. So this was Revolver's Fan First Podcast. This is Ken Andrews of Failure. Thank you for joining us. Good day to you.